story number one. It was always them versus us. And I don't mean left, right. I don't mean black, white. I don't mean Republican, Democrat. It was always, it will always be elite versus the people. If you think about it, every form of human civilization, every attempt at society building has created a situation of haves and have nots. It has created an inner circle and an outer circle. It has created a caste system. One could argue it's just what happens when you shuffle the dominoes. Some hands are good. Some hands are bad. When you shuffle society, some people end up with more. Some people end up with less. Some people ab end up above in status, in reputation, in lifestyle, others. The only real question is how. The only real question is with what type of sorting mechanism. Let's delve in for a moment to that word, caste. Of course, in Hinduism, status and elitism is defined by birth, is defined by religion. There are literal tiers of society until you arrive at the bottom, the untouchables. In medieval Europe, you had serfs and you had lords. Again, assigned by birthright. Behind birthright was, of course, at some point, violence and force. It was the taking of land and the taking of property. It was winners and losers, victors, and those that won enjoyed their plunder. Those that lost were assigned their caste. In socialism and its less watered-down communism, the caste system still existed. Oh, Marx's utopia that everyone would be the same and equally enjoy leisure was the wrapping paper, the selling point, the brochure, the propaganda. But in reality, what happens is those at the top tier arrive there by power, by politics. Do you think the Soviet Politburo lived in the same way the farmers did in central Ukraine? No, they did not. In fact, they starved, literally, through policy, purposefully, starved the farmers in central Ukraine. It's well known. There are movies made about this. In order to put a good face, they drew all the resources of the Soviet Union into Moscow, invited reporters from across the world, including the New York Times, to look at the new marvel of communism and proclaim it to the world in their, of course, oh-so-unbiased pages of the New York Times. Meanwhile, if one were to get on a train somehow past the Soviet guards and travel throughout the land, you would see literal bodies on the side of the train tracks. You would see cannibalism. You saw starvation. To this day, there's no real notice, no real numbers on how many people were starved in the Soviet Union. Us versus them. Them being those in power. And of course, the story of the Soviet Union or any other communist regime, modern day China, is for those that are in to remain in. That was simply the sorting mechanism. Many argue that capitalism creates a haves and have nots. Of course, that doesn't make unique capitalism. It's only the manner of the sorting mechanism. The bid on capitalism, on free markets, was through the thoughts of Adam Smith and those that embodied it and enshrined it in the United States of America, that you would maximize personal freedom through free markets, but also create the most meritocratic system in sorting out the haves and have-nots. Capitalism would do two things at the same time. While it would create us and them, it would create a less calcified, constipated, cemented version of the caste system. You could lift yourself up by the bootstraps. No one pretended you had an equal starting point, but they all agreed there needed to be equal opportunity. And you could rise up versus Hinduism, versus medieval Europe, versus communism from one tier to the next. What more? 
Not only could you rise up, but it would be done through meritocracy. Now, you and I go, both know there are holes in that game. It is imperfect, either through a corporatism or born on third base and think you hit a triple. There are people who don't have what they have through meritocracy, but there is probably no more meritocratic system than capitalism and the United States of America. It's the least imperfect and an imperfect world. So caste flexibility, meritocracy. This is how in the United States of America we've attempted to accomplish the most noble, least calcified, us versus them. The natural sorting mechanism from every organized society from tribalism to communism. Right now, as we talk, they are meeting in Davos, Switzerland. The World Economic Forum is meeting. They flew in on their G5 jets. John Kerry is talking about controlling the number of hamburgers that we might eat. He is dictating a better future for the plebes, for us. John Kerry, in a remarkable piece of sound, said, look at us here, all of us, select few, here to save the planet. It's almost extraterrestrial. He said, from the outside, that might look like liberal tree-hugging do-gooders, but we know we're tasked with this special purpose. It's really a stunning piece of sound because, first of all, I don't care if you're a liberal tree-hugging self-described do-gooder. I don't care if you disagree with me on politics. What I care is that you think you are better and should have divine right or extraterrestrial right to define my life. Kerry and those meeting at the World Economic Forum are not unique because they are socialist. They are not unique because they are communist. They're not unique because they are on the left. They are unique because they are the elite the self-described elite, who are looking for the sorting mechanism to ensure that they remain on the top. It doesn't really matter what sorting mechanism on which they arrive. If they thought capitalism would preserve their place on the top, oh, and trust me, there are corporations and corporate CEOs who see their way of staying at the top through corporatism. But if they thought that were the way, then the entire world would rally around corporatism. And they are to some degree. But their current focus in order to sort it out in their favor is climate change. It simply is. Everything under the umbrella falls under the fear-mongering of climate change. It is incredibly striking that the World Economic Forum, that somebody like Christopher Ray, the head of the FBI, is there saying, we've never had it better in terms of private-public partnerships. He's talking about law enforcement and big tech. He's talking about the ability of public institutions who have limitations in the United States of America through the Constitution to circumvent that through corporatism, through the private enterprise. What is the director of the FBI doing at Davos? That's the beginning and the end of that conversation. What's up, Chris? What are you doing here? Why is the director of the FBI at the World Economic Forum. Just full stop, pause, answer that question. Under what mandate? Under what job description? Under what advancement for law enforcement in the United States? Is it for child porn? Is it for child abuse? Is it for bank robberies? No, it's probably in service of bank robberies, just by men in suit and ties instead of ski masks at the World Economic Forum. What is Christopher Ray, head of the FBI, doing in Davos? He's ensuring that they have that partnership through corporatism and climate change to save their place in us versus them, to save their place in the elite. Yeah, John Kerry is there, along with his other climate stars like Al Gore. Do you know that Al Gore has made $300 million through climate fear-mongering? That's been reported. He now has made $300 million. I bet he doesn't regret losing his race for vice president. 
$300 million for being oh so wrong. I mean, John Al Gore, he rivals Paul Ehrlich, John Holdren, Thomas Malthus. At least for one of those, in the case of Malthus, he came about his wrongheadedness honestly. Ehrlich found a grift. Holdren found a grift over population, bestsellers for Holdren all the way to the White House and serving the Obama administration. Al Gore found the grift all the way to $300 million. And you say to yourself, maybe that's what this is about. Maybe it's not about control. Maybe it's about a grift. But here's the deal. It's easy to look at these buffoons, these Klaus Schwab's, these Albert Borla's, CEO of Pfizer, It's easy to look at them and say, look at these buffoons who think they run the world. I mean, our world is better organized from bottom up. And that's hard to circumvent. That's hard to overturn. That's hard to change. The United States of America, beautifully through geographic isolation and federalism, is a bottom up society, a bottom up culture. It's local first. And that's where you, I truly believe, I truly to this day believe, like others uh, such as Chris Rufo have pointed out, that is how you best effectuate change in society. Local school boards, local elections, local businesses, local chambers, local parades, local books, local history. Can I tell you a local history story I just picked up again? I know, I'm wearing you out. The duck hunt. I fell down the Wikipedia rabbit hole because one of my buddies had talked to me about the Red River Bridge War. So I'm from Texoma land. I'm from Sherman. Denison is just north, and just north of that is the Red River that separates Texas from Oklahoma. In the 1930s, there was a toll bridge that connected Texas and Oklahoma over the Red River. That toll bridge was privately owned uh, by a man whose last name is Colbert. That's now the name of a city in southern Oklahoma, Colbert. And he ran this toll bridge. Well, there was... A free bridge, a government bridge that was built just down the river from the toll bridge. The governor of Oklahoma wanted people to use the free bridge. I don't know the political details of why that may or may not be. But one of the things he did is barricade the toll bridge from the Oklahoma side. So Texas sent Texas Rangers, Texas National Guard up to barricade the free bridge. Okay, now Oklahoma sends its National Guard over to try to clear the free bridge. And you have a situation where essentially Oklahoma and Texas were literally in a armed standoff over which bridge would remain open, the private toll bridge or the free government bridge. Now, okay, interesting little bit of local history for your hometown, Will. What does that matter to us? Well, here's what's interesting. This story of the Red River Bridge War apparently made its way all the way to Germany. And Hitler, in the early 1930s, heard about this story. When he heard about this provincialism, this local conflict between the governors of Oklahoma and Texas and armed standoffs over the Red River, Hitler took it as a sign that the United States could never truly uh, rally around common cause, that the United States could be defeated because it's too provincial, too separated. Hitler, I would suggest to you, like the World Economic Forum, gets us wrong. From a distance, he doesn't know who we are. Oh, yeah, we fight. We fight like cousins. We fight like Hatfields and McCoys. We fight over a Red River rivalry modern day in football. We talk trash. We tell you that your state stinks. We vote with our feet. We move. We have common but separate cultures. We have accents. We have regionalism. But don't back us into a corner. We are common American. Because America is a land, it's also a people, and it's a way of life. It's a way of life that preserves that provincialism. That's who we are. We do solve problems best from the bottom up. Local is important, and we can laugh at what they're doing in Davos, but the pandemic taught us two things. The pandemic taught us that whatever is decided and whatever is brainstormed there in Davos makes its way to New Zealand, and Jacinda Ardern shuts down that country, makes its way to Dallas County, and Clay Jenkins decides you can't run 
a hair salon, and everyone's got to wear a mask. That's a county judge that dictated what happens in Dallas, Texas. It is defining what is acceptable. It's defining what is intelligent in the minds of these perverse elite. It is defining the way that local governance is decided. So we can't simply laugh. We can't simply point. We can't simply dismiss. Because what's happening at the World Economic Forum influences what happens locally. We learned that through COVID. That's what we pay attention to because the one other thing that's happening at the World Economic Forum is the reveal of the true divide among people in this land. Yes, just like Texas and Oklahoma, just like the Red River, we will fight. We will fight about right versus left. We will have our racial differences when we see things through different prisms and different lenses and do our best to arrive at understanding, see each other as individuals. We will have our differences at the ballot box between Republican and Democrat. But it is as the way it always has been. It is us versus them. And they're showing you in Davos. It is the elite versus the people. Story number two. As you know, it's not about tolerance. It's not even about support. It must be about celebration. Philadelphia Flyers, NHL hockey player, Ivan Povarov, I hope I have getting his name right, has said last week that he will not wear the... LGBTQIA Pride Night shirt in practice warm-ups before his NHL game. Provorov says he respects everyone, he respects their decision, but he will adhere to his religious beliefs, Russian Orthodox, and not participate in wearing the Pride-themed jersey this past Tuesday. He was pressed several times during an interview about... His decline to wear the ribbon. I bring this up and I think it's always so, well, it's so prescient. It says those Seinfeld were Nostradamus. You remember the episode where Kramer went to a march in support of the fight against HIV. He's there, he's signing up, and they want to hand him a ribbon. And he's supposed to wear the ribbon. He says, no thanks. You don't want to wear the ribbon? No, I'm good. But you are opposed to HIV. You're opposed to AIDS. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm going to march. I just don't want to wear the ribbon. Why don't you want to wear the ribbon? Because I don't have to wear the ribbon. Because it's America. It's free. I can wear what I want. You all, you won't wear the ribbon. You think he's bad. You think you're better than us. You think you don't have to wear the ribbon. You don't really support the fight against AIDS. No, get away from me. I just, I don't want to do it because, in fact, you're telling me I have to do it. And then the entire crowd crowd turns on Kramer. Hey, look at this guy. He won't wear the ribbon. And they all chase him down like he's a bigot who's been exposed. Not over the fight against HIV, not even against the march, which is symbolic in and of itself, but the decline to go the extra symbolic step of wearing the ribbon. All of this modern day virtue signaling has amounted to nothing more than shallow gestures, but shallow gestures that have taken on religious sacrament and religious sacrament that requires one to now, for now, for now, celebrate someone else's view of the world. Look, when the movement for LGBTQIA equality began, it was about gay marriage. And it was something that, for example, I'll tell you, and you can go back and you can look in 2010, As a conservative, as a Republican, I support it. And the idea in the 2000s was we were moving towards a place of tolerance. You go your way, I go mine. We treat each other equally. It was so commonly well held that that was a place of enlightenment and acceptance that it was the position that was too radical for, for example, the 2008 candidate for president on the Democratic ticket, Barack Obama. Never forget. Barack Obama opposed gay marriage in 2008. But while in 2008, for example, I might have been more tolerant than Barack Obama, we have moved well beyond that. Now, in order to be enlightened, in order to avoid being a cretin, you must support the cause. 
the political ideology. You must support, for example, just, just as an example, you needed to support and have an immediate reaction for the man in the woman's restroom at the massage or spa in L.A., We Spa. Remember that? It turns out he was a sexual predator, and your, not tolerance, but your support was injustice. But we've moved beyond even support to celebration. You must celebrate like kids on TikTok listening to another kid say, I'm coming out, I am gender fluid, I'm now a girl, I'm a boy. And the world has required that you clap like all those kids in the TikTok videos. That is enlightenment. Celebration. Not support. Not tolerance. I give you the reaction of the sports media to Ivan Provorov's choice not to wear the LGBTQIA pride-themed jersey. Greg Wyshynski of ESPN, a hockey writer, was very upset. Wyshynski said that Ivan Provorov should get out, that he should leave America. Um, his direct quote was that he labeled anyone not outraged by Provorov's statement a homophobe. And he suggested that Provorov leave and go back to Russia and fight in the Ukrainian war. Actually, Wyshynski of ESPN is one that said that everyone who disagrees with or everyone who agrees with Provorov is a, hom uh, is a homophobe. It is NHL Network uh, analyst E.J. Raddick who said the following, Ivan Provorov can get on a plane any day he wants and go back to a place where he feels more comfortable, take less money, and get on with his way of life that, that way if it's problematic to him. If it's this much of a problem, said E.J. Raddick, to assimilate into his group of teammates in the community and here in this country, if he feels that way, but the beauty is, if it bothers you that much, you can always leave. Go back to where you feel more comfortable. I understand there's a conflict going on over there. Maybe get involved. So according to EJ Reddick, pride-themed NHL jerseys are America. That is the community. Love it or leave it. Head back and fight in the Russia-Ukrainian war. This, I think, one would describe as xenophobic, intolerant. Jingoistic? No, not really a love of America. Just get the hell out if you don't agree with me. This is the view, not of freedom and tolerance. This is the view of intolerance and celebration. That in the land of the free, if you do not celebrate, you need to go back from where you came to fight in your third world war. A third world war, not a third world war. Get out says the intolerant celebratory press that covers hockey. This is, of course, unthinking. This is religious. Here on the Will Cain podcast sometimes back, Mike, uh, Michael Schellenberger, uh, who's been one of the Twitter Files writers, and I were talking. We've had several conversations with various guests about this. But in America, we have lost a sense of purpose, where once that purpose was, at least in part, filled by faith. Judeo-Christian ethics, religion, Christianity, that we have distanced and divorced ourselves from faith. We have divorced ourselves from that purpose. But human beings are not built to defy a deeper meaning. Human beings are not built to turn to the cold arms of science in the face of the unknown. No, no, we'll fill that with something. We'll fill that hole. And that we are filling that hole now with this Woke ideology, again, not of tolerance and not of support, but of celebration. And the celebration takes on the, the essentially the act, the symbolism of communion, just like in church, just like in religion. Wear the ribbon, wear the pride-themed jersey. You know, I have an interesting podcast coming out on Monday with former Texas Longhorns, New Orleans Saints, Miami Dolphins running back Ricky Williams. And we talk, Ricky and I, in there about human beings and fear. In the last episode of the Will Cain podcast, I talked with Dr. Drew Pinsky about this, that I, I did believe, and I still do believe the base human motivation is fear. 
But really, maybe the base human ambition is envy. And that's ugly. Not that I want, but I want what someone else has. And not that I want to accept the capitalism's, you know, rising tide lift all boats, but I'd rather burn down your house so that mine would be better. There's ugly polling about that, by the way, that if you had a choice between you and your neighbor splitting $500 or, you know, you getting it all and him getting none or even you getting a little and then taking away some of his, people choose often to suppress others to elevate themselves under the motivation of envy. It goes back to that base instinct that feeds into what we talked about in story number one with the World Economic Forum. We all, down at some level, want to be special. We all want to be elite. And this virtue sitting, this shallowness, this religion is the newest way to separate. And it's endemic to any religion. Look, I grew up in a small town church, and if you go to church, you know this. You sit up front. Or you sit in the back. Hmm. Which pew are you in at church? How holy are thou? There is this. I'm not saying everybody does this, but it is done. It is there. It is separation. It is sacrament. That is what this is. Ivan Provorov doesn't want to wear the jersey. I don't know if he supports LGBTQ issues or not. I mean, if we're going to have an honest conversation about this, and we are, of course, right here, at some point you have to run, and you do run headlong into the idea that in most religions, including not just Russian Orthodox, but pretty much every version of Christianity, that homosexuality is considered a sin. Now, do with that what you will, preacher, Protestant, Catholic, congregant. Do with that what you will, but it's there. Okay, so if someone, in this case, a Russian Orthodox, I'm going to assume, devout, adherent, and Ivan Provorov says, I'm not going to wear the ribbon, not going to take communion, not going to wear the pride theme jersey. What are you doing? Kicking him out of the land of the free. What are you doing? Asking, Failing to live up to his request that you respect him the same way he says he will respect others, I'm sure, on the continuum of tolerance. What are we doing? We all have to wear the ribbon. We all have to wear the jersey. We all now have to celebrate. Story number three. It's chapter two in the four-part series on the Cowboys' run to the Super Bowl. Let's do this quick. It's going to be not quick and painless. It's going to be painful. Let's go through the NFL divisional round playoff games ending in San Francisco 49ers and Dallas Cowboys. Here's what I think is going to happen in your four games this weekend. Kansas City versus Jacksonville. The line is eight and a half. I think Kansas City smokes Jacksonville. Look, I guess I've been a Jags denier or Jags doubter, right? I thought they would lose last weekend to the Chargers. They won in dramatic fashion. The Chiefs are another animal. And the Chiefs handled the Jags earlier this, seven, earlier this season, 27-17. to 17. Bottom line, when you play the Chiefs, if you got a superhero. You're playing Patrick Mahomes. So whatever scheme you have, good luck. Do you have somebody that can keep up with Patrick Mahomes? Not yet. Not yet for Trevor Lawrence. Giants and Eagles. Believe the line in this one. It's seven and a half. I don't have the line in front of me directly on what Giants and Eagles is, but here's what I believe, at least when it comes to just picking the game straight out. I sort of like the Giants. And if it is like that, six, seven points, I think I'd take them. I don't like that the Eagles had a week off. I don't like that Jalen Hurts has a little bit of a bum shoulder. And I really like the way that Brian Dable has this offense Organized for Daniel Jones. Now, look, I don't think the Giants are a Super Bowl team, but they're an upset team. I mean, they beat a not very good Vikings team. And then now they have to play a legitimately good Eagles team. But there's something about this for me that adds up to watch this game as your upset special. Bills, Bengals. Here's another one I would have said. The line on this one is five and a half. I would have said, here's your upset special. Bengals over Bills. 
I think that the Bengals are playing good football. I like Joe Burrow. Here's the problem, though. The Bengals' offensive line is falling apart in real time, like every day. They're losing another offensive lineman every game. I, they may have backups in four out of the five spots in the offensive line. I don't know where they are, but it's been the Achilles heel of the – I can't help but when I say Achilles heel, think of that. Did you all see that Wheel of Fortune clip? If you haven't, go look at it online. The guy solves the puzzle. He gets the million dollar spin. He got it, and he keeps guessing all the right letters. He, I guess, he knows what it is, and he gets the whole thing spelled out. Like there's no more gaps. He got all the right letters. He had the million dollar spin, so his bank is huge. And now, literally, all he has to do is read the puzzle. Right, zero gaps in the puzzle. And I don't remember what it said. Let's just pretend for a moment that it said modern day Achilles. Right. Modern day Achilles doesn't matter, but he says, as he's reading the now solved puzzle, modern day Achilles and Pat Sajak's like, ah, it's too bad. I can't give you credit for that. And he moves on so coldly and lets somebody else and says to the next person, can you solve the puzzle? And she goes, you bet I can modern day Achilles. And my man who just read it, Achilles is just sitting there like a deer in the headlights. I just lost millions. It is excruciating but the Achilles heel for the Bengals their offensive line that's going to keep me from being able to project them over the Bills so take the Bills and then finally Cowboys 49ers all right let's lean in for just a moment here's the deal nothing on paper says Cowboys it doesn't Kyle Shanahan is an amazing coach. He has taken above average quarterbacks to the NFC Championship game. The Niners have been there repetitively over the last 10 years. He's done with Jimmy Garoppolo, and now he's doing it with Brock Purdy. They have the most confusing offense for a defense out there. Constant misdirection and motion through the running game, which whole is Christian McCaffrey, Elijah Mitchell, whoever's running the ball, going through. And now they have McCaffrey, who's amazing and fits this perfectly. They've got George Kittle, they've got Brandon Ayuk, and of course they have Debo Samuel. They've got weapons everywhere, but I'm more concerned, more concerned than the weapons. The one weapon I'm particularly concerned about is Christian McCaffrey. But more than the weapons, I am concerned about Kyle Shanahan's scheme. I can see Cowboys linebackers, Leighton Vander Esch, and defense, not knowing where it's going. I don't know. They're guessing wrong gaps, and they're ripping off 25-yard runs throughout the game. I can see that happening. And not having to lean on rookie seventh-round pick Brock Purdy. On the other side of the ball, the Niners' defense is really good, and they continuously have been successful in shutting down the Cowboys' run. Tony Pollard, Zeke Elliott, whatever. And then there's a ton of pressure on Dak Prescott if they can't run the ball for him to be perfect. And the bottom line is the Niners' defense is really good. The only logical Achilles heel for Achilles heel for the Niners is Brock Purdy. Does he turn into a pumpkin? Is the ball over? Is he no longer Cinderella? Does he all of a sudden throw two picks and the Cowboys win? And that's where I hang my hope. That's where I place my faith, and that's where I say this is the second chapter in a four-part run to the Super Bowl for the Cowboys. I do think the Cowboys have to be perfect. They're going to have to be perfect. They're going to have to get interceptions or fumbles. They've got to get two turnovers. And on top of that, Dak has to be perfect. On top of that, for Dak to be perfect, they're going to have to. They're not going to have to run like crazy. You don't get to have to get 150 yards rushing. But they're going to have to get some success on the run, on the ground, so that San Francisco honors it. So there's holes in the zone for Dak to play like he did against Tampa Bay. If Zeke and Tony go nowhere, two-yard runs, big trouble. But I forgot. I'm on faith. I believe. There's no point in not believing. There's no point. Ride the highs. Feel the lows. I think the Cowboys are legitimately good. Good enough to beat the Niners? Well, I believe. Let's go, Cowboys. That's going to do it for me today here on the Will Kane Podcast. Check in again Monday for reaction to Cowboys Niners. Plus, I'm telling you, a wild and fascinating conversation with Ricky Williams. I'll see you again on Monday.
Hey, it's Will Kane. Click here to subscribe to the Fox News channel on YouTube. It's the best way to get our latest interviews and highlights. And click to subscribe to the Will Kane podcast for full episodes right now.